This is Ray Monsolder. One of the great things of writing a book that's really powerful and sells millions of copies is that well, they're going to last much longer than the author. And in this case, we're talking about Tim LaHaye, who's gone ahead of us to heaven and could tell us so much about it if he could write from there. But this is enough. A great story combined with Craig Parshall, and I just am enjoying it immensely. Chapter 44 of the first book in the end series, Edge of Apocalypse. Pardiver still couldn't believe it was happening. Darlene Rice had settled in fairly well at the Living Waters Recovery Center in Tucson. From her vantage point, she felt as if she was making progress. The question now was whether the rehab specialist thought so too. Now Darlene was sitting across the desk from a female drug counselor named Margaret. It was her first review after being at the center for several weeks. All this still felt foreign to Darlene. One good thing, Darlene thought to herself, was that she really liked Margaret. She was kind, but tough, a straight shooter. Margaret looked up from her report, smiled, and began. We finished the assessment. During the days you've been here, we all think you've been cooperative. In the end, you're the one who will be directing your own recovery may look like we're the one in charge, but not really. A person has to understand they have an addiction and then they have to want to get better. From our perspective, it looks to us like you do. That's a really good thing, Darley. We're very encouraged. You should be too. Darlene smiled back but she was shaking a little. She wanted to hide her hands, which hadn't stopped trembling since she'd been taken off her excessive prescriptive drugs. Yet somehow she knew this was a place where it was okay for hands to shake like mine. They would understand. Yes, she would have preferred that Abigail be there too to hold her hand. But then maybe it was for better this way. Darlene knew she had to learn how to walk the road to recovery from her addiction on her own. Margaret continued, We've got a picture now of your situation. I'd like to talk to you about the next steps. First, I noticed that your husband, Fortis, we call him Fort. Okay, Fort. Didn't come during visiting day yesterday. That, that's no big deal. People have busy schedules. But I just wanted to ask some more about him. Well, we, we talked in the interview already about Fort. Margaret was nodding softly, but Darlene saw that she wasn't buying it. She liked Margaret. She had the wonderful knack of getting down to the truth of Darlene's drug addiction without making it too painful. In other words, she used anesthetic before doing emotional surgery. Mm. And that was really important 
to Darlene. She thought, I've been using drugs to numb the anxiety and fear about so many things. Seeking comfort from pain whenever I could. After losing Jimmy, I needed to escape from anything that hurt me. I know that now. But what do I tell her about Fort? So your husband, Darlene, decided it was time to blurt it out. So she said, Fort hasn't bought into this whole counseling thing. He's very traditional, a private man. He's not convinced I really have an addiction. He doesn't like the idea of a group program where people tell other people their problems. His attitude is just stop taking the pills. Plus, there's one other thing. Other thing? The fact that this is a Christian drug rehab center. Oh my, he really does have a problem with that. Darlene gave a little chuckle. Fort says that too many people use God as the front man for all their problems. But you came here anyway. Yes. <clears throat> My good friend, Abby Jordan, recommended it. I'm so glad she did. Abby's one of those glow girl Christians. That's what I call it. You know, they have an inner glow, like the power light on your curling iron that lets you know it's hot and ready to go. Anyway, she's got a power inside that other people don't have, and I'd love to have that. Well, we talked about that in the session last night, right? Yeah, and I've been thinking a lot about what you said. It's a little like what Abby used to say to me, even before she found out about my addiction. Not just solving a problem, but transformation. And remember how that happens. You said it was through the transforming power of Jesus Christ. Margaret said, right. Look, I was an addict myself. Jesus changed my life completely. That's where Margaret stopped talking. She smiled and leaned back. For a moment, no one said a word. Then Darlene, whose brow was wrinkled in thought, looked up and spoke. You know what? I want that too. You can. I don't know. I've felt so lost since Jimmy died. I didn't, don't even know how to begin. Just like there are steps to recovery, there are steps to getting right with God First, recognizing that you, like all of us, are a sinner. Not a popular phrase anymore. Not politically correct, but eternally true. Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Darlene nodded vigorously. Oh, I've blown it so many, many times. Sometimes it feels like I just can't help myself. Next, you need to understand that God loves you. He hasn't forsaken you. He's made a plan that can bring you into his family. His word says that he loved the world so much 
that he gave his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him won't perish, but will have everlasting life on the cross. Died for us, exactly. The only way our sins can be forgiven, washed clean, absolutely clean, cleaner than that extra strong stuff with bleach that I use obsessively to clean my bathroom fixtures, Darlene said, and they both smiled. Cleaner than clean, but you have to do it God's way. Declare that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for your sins, that he rose from the grave three days later, just as the Bible says. Darlene took a moment to be sure. She'd been thinking about this for a long while. After she talked to Abby for the first time about the change in her life, then so many other times after that, that they would talk about God and how things had changed for Abby. It was as if a wind had been at her back all of this time, pushing Darlene from behind, moving her to this point. Yes, I believe all that. Darlene said, I remember what Abby used to tell me. She used to ask me whether I was willing to invite Jesus Christ into my heart to forgive my sins and to change my life forever. I'd change the subject. I wasn't ready, but now I am. I want Jesus to be my savior. I mean, personally, not just some religious figure on a cross or in a picture, but to be real. I want to meet him in my heart. And I don't want to put this off any longer. They both bowed their heads. Just then, Darlene had the instinct to get down on her knees. So she did. And Margaret followed her to the floor, sitting next to her, both of them resting their arms and hands on the couch. I'm a sinner, God, Darlene said with her eyes closed tight, her voice trembling. No surprise there, right? You always knew that, and I know that. I believe your son, Jesus, died on the cross for my sins. Then he walked out of the grave because, well, he had to because he's the Son of God. Not a problem for God's Son to get that done. So God, I want Jesus Christ to come into my heart. Please have him come, God. I need him to save me, clean me up. Not just the pills, but everything. Her words were wavering and caught in her throat as she continued. I want Jesus to be totally in charge. A changed life transformation. Please, God, I need this so badly. That's when the tears came and the words stopped. 
Margaret put her arm around Darlene, whose shoulders were shuddering. They sat together on their knees for a long time. People walked past the office talking and laughing, but Darlene didn't notice. A few hours later, Darlene was in her room, still thinking about what had happened. A thought occurred to her. She laughed loudly and yelled, Oh, yes! I've got to do it! She dialed the number by heart. She got Abigail Jordan's voicemail and said, Guess what, Abby dear? I prayed a prayer today. And anyway, I guess I've become a glow girl. Darlene clicked off the phone and sat down on her bed. She w couldn't wait to talk to Abigail about it. But then an instant later, a thought flashed through her mind. What in the world do I tell Fort? Chapter 45 Joshua was now in hiding. He checked himself into the triplex suite at the Palace Hotel in Midtown Manhattan. Only two people knew where he was. One was Abby. The other was his longtime private chauffeur, who had booked the room under his brother-in-law's name and paid cash, so Joshua's name wouldn't appear on the registry. Then he took one more step to ensure he wouldn't be tracked. Joshua's company had been developing a super-secure all-phone, one with signal cloaking capacity so it couldn't be located via satellite or tower tracing. It was designed for special op guys operating in hostile territory. But the Defense Department put the project on hold. Joshua was carrying the prototype with him. Even Harry Smythe didn't know his location. But he did advise Joshua that while the federal bench warrant didn't rate the kind of priority given to escape prisoners or violent offenders, this was still a serious business. If Joshua was stopped for a traffic ticket, or recognized by a federal agent in public somewhere, the jig was up. Joshua's plan was to stay undercover until the Amara News Media Service got off the ground. The project was taking longer than Phil Rankowitz had predicted. Then hopefully the Roundtable's project would ignite citizens into immediate action. People would learn that Joshua's real motives in resisting Senator Strayworth's heavy-handed demands about the RTS system were to protect America. Voters would discover that a gang of Washington politicians were trying to send an American hero to jail. The phone lines at the Capitol switchboard would light up with angry calls from American citizens. Strayworth would see his approval ratings dropping like a bowling ball in a swimming pool. What else could he do but withdraw the subpoena entirely? At least that was the scenario. But Joshua understood the odds, exactly how many dots had to be perfectly connected for all that to work. 
the thought of jail didn't worry him. Oh, sure, Abby was probably right that the bad press of being incarcerated could stain his professional reputation and irreparably damage his businesses. But Joshua had a more tactical worry. If I'm locked up, I can't run things. I can't direct the decisions that need to be made about the Amara News Project. And what about the RTS refinements that my engineering team and I are working on? We're just on the verge of solving a potential design problem. I can't afford to be taken out of action. But he knew it. It was dinner time and he was hungry. Just as he was about to order room service, he noticed the message light flashing on the hotel phone from the front desk. He dialed them and was told that a note was waiting for him. Joshua told them to send it up. A few minutes later, a billman arrived with a sealed envelope. On the outside were written the words, To the gentleman in room 2507. After tipping the billman, he ducked back into his room and read the note. Joshua Jordan, you don't know us, but we know you. It's important we talk. We can help. I'm downstairs in the private dining room, the one with the closed doors. is not visible to the public I'll have a dinner waiting for the two of us. Please forgive me for the note, but in the interest of discretion, I must not be seen coming up to your room. Signed, The Patriot's Wife. Joshua's first thought was that his cover had been blown. Someone knew where he was. Was this a trap to lure him out of his room? But if the feds were behind it, they wouldn't be using this cloak and dagger stuff. They would simply come up to his room unannounced, armed with a warrant. Now this was something else. He knew he had friends in the Pentagon who were quietly supportive of him. Maybe there were others. But one thing was clear now that a federal judge had targeted him for arrest. He needed all the help he could get. Let's do this. It looks like it's time to take a calculated risk. Ten minutes later, Joshua was seated in a private room off the main dining room behind polished mahogany doors that had been closed, eating dinner across the table from an attractive middle-aged woman. Joshua took another bite of his filet mignon. He had noticed that his host was fashionably dressed though Abby would have recognized even more, like the exclusive Vera Wang dress and the carrot weight of the diamond studs in her ears, like two carrots each. Sorry to be secretive, the woman said, but I know you're currently undercover, Mr. Jordan. At first, let me tell you how much my husband and I appreciate you. Joshua flashed a quick smile and said, thank you, but immediately had several questions. Your husband is described in your note 
only as the Patriarch. Do I know him? I don't think so. But he thinks you're on the right track. He wanted you to know that. And I, which track would that be? Your distrust of Senator Strayworth. And perhaps if you have other members or their staff on the special committee investigating the North Korean missile crisis. My husband also agrees with your decision not to give them the RTS design information. Some members of that committee can't be trusted. It was clear this woman had a sharp understanding of Joshua's world. I applaud you and your husband, whoever he is, Joshua said. You apparently have a grasp of issues that the media hasn't covered. She smiled. There was something behind the smile. Her next comment told Joshua a lot. Sorry to be so clandestine, but we both need to be cautious. Her choice of words rang bells, so Joshua pushed a little. What is it you came here to tell me? You're in danger. Ha! <laughs> That's not very specific. I realize that. Let's just say that I'm not talking about the things you're already aware of, like the crazies out there who don't understand the reasons for what you did, or the Capitol Hill political bunch that wants to bury you. None of that. Then what? We have the distinct sense from multiple sources that you're at substantial risk from foreign actors. Again, our choice of words, the familiar intelligence lingo rang a bell with Joshua. Well, what can I do about it? Nothing yet. I just want you to know we're out there. If you're willing we can set up a meeting so you can be briefed in more detail. Well, this is all very interesting, but I still don't know your name. For now, I'm just the Patriot's wife, she said with a smile. Then she reached inside her little purse, which was exquisitely decorated with white beads and pulled out something. She laid it on the table. A white business card. All it said was the Patriot and there was a telephone number. He took the card, fingered it, then looked over at the woman. Now it was time to get blunt. Now, <clears throat> How do I know I can trust you or your husband? That should be simple, she said with a grin. Then she rose to leave. Ever the gentleman, Joshua rose to his feet with her. She reached out and shook his hand. Then before turning to leave, she said one more thing to Joshua. Perhaps you can reflect on two things. First, we were able to locate you here, even though you took great precautions to hide from the federal authorities. The U.S. Marshals haven't been able to find you so far, but we did. And the second, we haven't reported you. Chapter 46 In the crowded upscale piano bar called Johnny One Note, 
on Park Avenue South, Attorney Alan Folson was sitting across the booth from his contact. They'd just ordered drinks and were engaging in small talk. But the other man, Bill Cheevers, an executive vice president for the North American division of World Teleco, was getting impatient. Ellen, you said you had information for me. Are you up to speed on the pending negotiation between World Teleco and a media group called Mountain News? Enterprises, MNE, it's no longer a pending negotiation. It's a signed media distribution contract. I'm not sure I'm going to go into any more details than that. Maybe you should talk to our corporate lawyers. Ellen Folson laughed coarsely and said, Oh no, Bill. That's definitely not what I ought to do. Why not? I'm a lawyer. I know what happens when the pencil neck corporate counsel inside an organization like yours gets a whiff of this kind of insider information. They all get nervous. They run to the first whistle they can blow. They threaten to call in some federal agency to look into it. Oh, because they don't want to get caught in the middle or lose their law license or worse. Bill Cheevers glanced around the bar quickly for any familiar faces. Finding none, he turned to the lawyer across from him. Okay. Look, Ellen, the only reason that you and I are having this discussion is that you can handle my sensitive personal legal stuff. So let's get to it. That media group, MNE, is a cover. For what? A radical group? Don't know the name, but it meets secretly. Some very powerful people in it. How do you know this? As luck would have it, a retired former Idaho Supreme Court judge named Fortis Rice approached me about this secret group. You know, to feel me out. They meet regularly in some clandestine spot in the Rocky Mountains. Why do you approach you? His group needs some more legal muscle, I guess. I think it's because they liked some of the issues I argued when I was in the Solicitor General's office. Frankly, I didn't agree with half the cases I had to argue. But that's Washington. You do what you got to do. You pretend you believe in it. I must have been more convinced than I realized. And this group you mentioned. Yeah, full of, uh, full of extreme anti corland people. Seems that you either have to be filthy rich or really well connected or both to be invited in. I guess they thought I was the latter. I'm sure not the former, though I'm working on that one. Then Folson smiled and took a swig from his glass. And they don't know you have a connection to me as my personal lawyer. Nah. Question Rice asked me was whether I ever represented World Teleco. I said no, which is technically correct, very technically. But how did you find out about the connection between Mountain News Enterprises and this secret political group? Alan Folson laughed again. Because after Rice talked to me, 
I started digging around like a West Virginia coal miner looking for information. And I know how to find it in this town. Hey, when opportunity knocks. Bill Cheevers was putting it all together in his head. Then he had a question to ask. Which leads me, Ellen, to the obvious question. What's in this for you? I'm just trying to be a good boy scout. Come on. What do you want all, out of all of this? Bill, all I need you to do is to make sure this contract between World Teleco and Mountain News Enterprises on behalf of Rice's group goes nowhere. You don't have to be concerned with how I benefit from it when that happens. If we breach a signed contract on a national media buy like this, well, that could be a real litigation nightmare for us. Consider the consequences, such as this covert group is planning on taking aim against the Corland administration. Real scorched earth stuff. By facilitating their plan, whatever that is, World Teleco is going to stir up the wrath of the White House. Well, we may have to take our chances. You definitely don't want to do that. Why not? The White House could bring down your company's entire telecommunication empire, Bill. Seriously, along with your World Teleco stock portfolio, your profit sharing plan, you get the picture. That is a bold claim. Outrageous, actually. I need specifics. How about a call from the White House? Would that work for you? Bill Cheevers was stunned. He pushed his glass away from him and he said, But a breach of contract? Companies do it every day. Have your lawyers find, you know, some loophole. That's what you pay them for. Then he bent forward and said, You've got to stop this media plan from happening. After looking at his watch, Wilson added, in one hour, you'll get a call from a restricted number. Pick it up. It'll be in the White House. After that call, I think you're going to want to pull the rug out from under this Mountain News Enterprises deal. Bill Cheevers didn't finish his drink. He got up quickly and looked around the bar once more. His last words to the attorney was, I'll be waiting for that call. Then he left. Ellen Folsom emptied his glass and exited a few minutes later. That was when another man at the bar, who had been watching the two of them, pulled out his all phone and dialed a number. A man answered the phone on the other end and simply announced, This is the Patriot. The man at the bar said, I just eyeballed the rendezvous between Folsom and a fellow named Bill Cheevers. Who's Cheevers? High-ranking executive with World Teleco. Okay, keep on it. Get the information to me in the usual way. Will do. The man at the bar clicked shut his encrypted all phone, paid his tab, and left. In downtown Philadelphia, at the police headquarters, 
John Gallagher was getting tired of waiting. He was supposed to meet with a detective who was going to show him surveillance footage of the lobby of the corporate building where Roger French worked. But just before Gallagher arrived, the detective was pulled out on another field investigation. Gallagher glanced at his watch. Man, I'm going to have to ditch my plane reservation. I'll never make it to New York in time to meet with Miles first thing tomorrow. Maybe there's a late train I can still catch. Gallagher called the ticket office for the express train. Yes, he could still catch the last one, which left in 90 minutes. He booked it over the phone. And that was when the detective strode into the video viewing room where Gallagher had been waiting. He had a uniformed cop with him. He delivered his weary apologies to Gallagher, then turned to his video forensics officer and told him to start running the footage. Gallagher's eyes were fixed on the paper-thin flat-screen monitor on the wall. The time and date were running in the lower right-hand corner of the black-and-white video as the image of an empty corporate building lobby was cast on the screen. Sorry they didn't use color footage, but these building owners always go the cheap route. No, this is better, Gallagher muttered. Black-and-white gives you better definition least for what I want. The tech guy then fast-forwarded the video to the point in time two hours before the estimated time of Roger French's death. Then he slowed it down only slightly till they saw the image of a man in a suit entering the lobby. Stop there, Gallagher shouted out. They froze the frame. A man of medium height, well-dressed, broad shoulders, confident strut, but his head was slightly turned away from the camera. A shiver crawled up Gallagher's spine. Zoom in. The tech guy brought the image closer. It blurred a little with magnification. Gallagher stared at it. He had to know. Was it Ada Zindler? Okay, roll it, but very slowly, frame by frame. So the tech did. The man in the lobby, as he was caught in each sequential choppy frame, had kept his face turned away. Then he brought his face back toward the, gal toward the camera. Gallagher stood up. Let me see you, you stinking scum. Show your face. Man in the lobby in the jerky frames, kept looking down, fiddling with the buttons of his suit coat, keeping his face hidden. Look at me, Gallagher shouted out. And just then, as the man in the lobby was approaching the elevator doors, he gave a side glance toward the watch on his left wrist. Really revealing about half of his face. Stop! Gallagher yelled out, and the frame froze. Bring it in. The tech magnified the frame till a face could be partially seen. Gallagher 
walked right up to this screen. He touched it with his index finger. I know it's you. I know it. Then Gallagher wheeled around. Can we get an immediate high-def JPG image of this emailed to somebody? The video forensic, uh, forensics officer came out of the control room and looked at the detective who nodded the okay. Out of his wallet, Gallagher fished an email address for the facial identification unit of the Biometrics Technology Division of the FBI. Then he gave it to the video guy. I need, need this email stat, he said. On his way to the railroad station, Gallagher called the private home number of Sally Bocek, the facial ID, ID guru at the bureau. She was watching TV. After nine rings, she picked up. Sally, it's John Gallagher here. Jeez, Johnny, I'm here at home in my PJs. What's up? Got a favor to ask. Sorry about this, but it's really important. Yeah? I'm having an image of a guy being emailed to your office as we speak. Really? Can't this wait? No, it can't. Truly, life or death, please. Oh, fine. What's the possible match? A guy in our files by the name of Ada Zimler. I need a facial ID match. Where's the image from? Lobby surveillance footage. She groaned again. Oh, those are usually pretty lousy. You're a genius. You can make it unlousy. Okay. Give me about an hour to get down to the bureau. You owe me big time, Gallagher. You name it. I'll call you on the cell when I've completed the analysis. I'm naming you in my will, Sally. Really. Wonderful. A quarter share of nothing is, let me see. I'll be waiting on pins and needles. See ya. Gallagher looked at his watch again. He figured that he just might be able to make that train after all. In Manhattan, Bill Cheevers, the World Teleco executive, was looking at his watch too. He had settled back in his hotel room but was getting it was getting late. It was one hour since he'd met with Alan Folson. So where is that phone call? He figured that, for whatever reason, his lawyer was lying or exaggerating. Why? He didn't know. Cheevers was just about to turn off his all phone for the night when it rang. He looked on the LCD screen. It said, Restricted. Cheevers couldn't believe it. When he answered the person on the other end, a woman spoke up. Mr. Cheevers, this is Lana Orvilla. I'm a Chief of Staff to Vice President Jessica Tolrud. How are you this evening? Good, thanks. Sorry to call you so late. That's not a problem. Purpose of my call is because the Corland administration is very concerned about possible antitrust violations being committed. Oh, yes. What kind of violations? 
Well, large telecommunication companies like yours, World Teleco, for instance, were considering whether it might be appropriate for an investigation to be launched into those kinds of allegations. You know, bring it to the attention of the Department of Justice. Well, I can assure you that World Teleco has not violated the Sherman Act or anything else. I'm sure you're right. This is a friendly call asking for your cooperation. What kind of cooperation? Any cooperation that you deem appropriate. Cheevers paused. He had to get it nailed down if he was going to have his company break a contract with Mountain News Enterprises. He had to know for certain that this was what the White House was asking them to do to avoid an antitrust investigation. Please know that I would, of course, be happy to cooperate completely, but the vice president's chief of staff interrupted him. You're friends with Ellen Fulson, the lawyer, I understand. Yes, he's a good man. He gives good advice, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. Cheever said, and that was it. There was nothing more to say. Lena Orvilla thanked him for taking the call so late, then said goodbye. Cheevers immediately called the voicemail of the corporate legal counsel in the all phone media transactions department. He left a message. This is Bill Cheevers. Please give me your best legal avenue first thing tomorrow for a termination of our all phone contract with Mountain News Enterprises. We're going in a different direction on that. Please make this the very highest priority and please send an alert to the operations department about the pending deal that I think they were calling AmeriNews. Tell operations that the deal is permanently canceled. Chapter 47 John Gallagher finally pulled into the Grand Central Station at 7.30 in the morning. The train had been delayed getting out of the Philly station then another delay at one of the stops. And after grabbing a cup of coffee at a window snack stand, he dashed up the stairs and outside to catch a cab. His meeting with Miles Zatternick was set for 8.30. With crosstown rush hour, he'd be lucky to be on time. In the middle of traffic, which was crawling along like a slug. He received a call from Sally Borchek. She had finished working on the video image. Great timing. I need this for a conference. What's the bottom line? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not giving it to you. Not until I go over some preliminaries first. In the cab, Gallagher pretended to strangle his all phone with both hands. He said, Sally, can we skip that stuff? I'm really in a rush. Look, you're the one who caught me in my comfy PJs in front of the television. I was already halfway into the old version of of The Detective with Robert Mitchum. I love that movie. They almost never run that on television. So back off, John. 
Give me a break here, Sally. No, you give me a break. I did you a favor, and I know what's going to happen. You'll use my analysis as the reason for some Normandy invasion that you want to launch somewhere. And if things go bad, who do you think your bureau is going to blame? Me, of course. But fine, you win. Give me the drill. Okay. Facial ID and biometric matches depends on the quality of the subject image. In this case, that video clip you sent me wasn't good. But adequate, adequate for analysis, right? Tell me it was minimally adequate. Borchek sighed. Yeah, minimally adequate. Now there are 80 facial variants we use to create a face print. Skull size, facial measurements, interrelationships between facial structures. 80 variants, good. Moving on. Range of certainty on the upper scale is measured from 60 to 90 percent. And now just scroll this one. Remembering the qualifiers I just mentioned? Sure, right. What's the score? I rated your video image at 67 percent certainty that the facial characteristics in the video match that of the known subject at a Zimbler. Certainty. I love that word. Yeah, but it's on the low end of certainty, Borchek reminded him. But only because of the poor quality of video and the angle the guy had with his head partially obscured. True. On the other hand, with better video and a full face shot, who knows, maybe would have much less than a 67% match. In other words, no match at all. But Gallagher didn't care about the negative possibilities. Right now he had the necessary forensic basis to pursue a full investigation of Anna Zimler's presence with the United States. He was on a roll. Sally, I got what I needed, Gallagher said as he reached over to pay the taxi driver. You're brilliant. Gallagher rushed his way through security at the Bureau headquarters by 8.35. He was in Miles Zatternack's office at 8.39. Miles was dressed in his black suit, pressed white shirt, and plain, plain single-colored tie. Gallagher was crumpled from the all-night train ride and was sweaty. Miles, I've got some breaking stuff I need to tell you about. Gallagher said. And I have some things to tell you, Saturnak said blandly. Let's start with my agenda item first. Sure. You're going to have to remove yourself from any further investigation into Ada Zimler. Gallagher, Gallagher kept up his grin and nodded his head athletically up and down. He half expected this, but he figured he now had something he could wedge in the door before his supervisor closed it on him completely. Okay, which is what I wanted to talk to you about. But Zatternak cut in. It was clear he had a speech and he was going to make it. You don't understand, John, 
you're being removed from any further investigation, not just dealing with unassembler, but any field work for the time being. You're being placed on desk duty here at headquarters. Meanwhile, I'm arranging you for you to take some counseling in Bureau professionalism. Gallagher was getting red in the face. Wait just a minute. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Your attitude borders on insubordination, which is a serious problem. But Gallagher was going to pull his way through. I have a facial match between Anna Zimler and a suspect who just tortured and murdered this son-in-law of a former high-ranking Pentagon general. It just happened. Over in Philadelphia, we have a forensic match, Miles. Come on. Our forensics? Yes. Sally Borchek and bio Biometrics. She did a match from some lobby surveillance video taken at the time of the murder and at the scene of the crime. What level of certainty? Now Gallagher had to swallow hard. This was the hard sell. 67%. But this was from lobby video. Zimler was clearly trying to duck away from the camera, but was still within the ranges of certainty that we need for an investigation, enough for probable cause for warrants, wiretaps, you know it. Zetternak gave his favorite emotional, emotionless, plaster of Paris expression. He spoke in something just above a monotone, but what he had to say was outrageous. Okay, John, take a deep breath. All right, relax. Here's the story. We've been told that Anna Simler is in custody in Paris. Who took him in? We're waiting for confirmation, but the Attorney General himself has told us to stand down. We don't want to risk some false identification of innocent persons. Apparently some foreign diplomat is entering the United States and is worried he'll be flagged as similar. That's all I know. Gallagher shut his eyes and shook his head as he spoke. No, we wouldn't want that. Sure, maybe a psychopathic terrorist might slip through our fingers and mosey around America, slashing, killing, torturing. But the main thing is we treat people nicely. That's enough, Saturnak nearly shouted. It was a rare show of emotion. Then he continued, John, it's called Bureau Professionalism. You'll learn all about it in your counseling sessions. That's all for now. I've got some other matters to attend to. Thanks for your time, Vera. My secretary will assign you a desk. Gallagher felt his brain go numb like someone had given him a shot of Novocaine there, but forgot to do the surgery. He walked out to Vera's desk. She smiled courteously and led him to a cubicle, cubicle not even an office. She pointed to a desk. This will be your work area, she said. Then she left. Gallagher sat down at the desk. He knew that then that he was standing on the banks of a Rubicon, a place where years later 
he would look back and realize he needed to make one really smart decision. Something that would make sense. A path that would ensure his future. He would re be retiring before long. He had put too much into his work at the Bureau to trash it now. So there was a serious question pending. Was Gallagher going to throw it all away for a mere 67% certainty? The more he thought about it, the more it didn't make any sense. Man, 67% isn't even a passing grade. That's flunking. Then he drummed his fingers on the naked desktop in front of him. He couldn't shake another competing thought. On the other hand, 67 might be passing after all. Some teachers grade 60 to 70 as a D, right? Then there's the fact that some teachers grade on a curve. He propelled himself up on his feet. He walked fast, past Vera's desk, on his way to the elevator. Agent Gallagher, Vera called out toward his quickly moving frame. Gotta feed the meter, he called back and disappeared into the elevator. And when he was on the street, he put in a call to Ken Leary over at the CIA. Ken Gallagher here. Gotta talk fast. They're closing me down on my investigation into Zimbler. Whoa. I need any further updates you have on Zimbler or the murder of that professor over in Bucharest, and I need it in like, oh, five minutes. You're really out there on this one, John. I don't know how much I can afford to stick my neck out any more than I have. If you ever owed me money, Ken, all debts are canceled. How about that? Actually, you owe me money. Okay, forget it. Look, Ken, I, I really need this. You know how long I've been after this sicko, Zimler. Larry took a full five seconds. Gallagher was pacing on the sidewalk, looking around to make sure he wasn't being observed. Finally, Larry spoke. Look, there's a Korean laundry about two blocks from my office. Yang's dry cleaning. Meet me there in ten minutes. First, tell me something. What? Do you have more stuff on Zimler or not? I can't afford to waste time. Um, figure it out, John. <laughs> We're going to discuss possible clandestine information from the CIA but a world-class terrorist, and I chose a Korean dry cleaners as the meeting place. What does that tell you? And that's it. We'll find out what it tells him tomorrow. And chapter 48 will begin. Edge of Apocalypse.